Our text for this evening, as this morning, is a section, more than one verse. And so I direct your attention to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And I'm going to read from verse 12 to 18. The book of Ecclesiastes, or subtitled The Preacher, chapter 1, chapter 1, and reading from verse 12. Verse 12. Let us hear together again the word of God. I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. I communed with my own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit, for in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. In the introduction that we made concerning this book, we were introduced, of course, to the preacher who is Solomon, King Solomon, the son of David. And we were made aware of his experience of decline, of turning away from the Lord, but also of knowing the Lord, by which we were able then to be brought to have two windows on life. First of all, Solomon, by his experience, and in these very words, communicates to us life without God, how life is viewed under the sun when God is not in the picture. And the seeking, the pursuing of meaning and fulfillment and happiness without God. And the result of it all is summarized in verse 2. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. It is transitory, breath of breaths, like a bubble that comes and then bursts. But then, of course, as we've stated, Solomon is able to show us that the meaning of life is found in God and worshipping God and living for God. And this, of course, is how this book ends in chapter 12 and verse 13 and 14. But verse 13 there, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, fear God. And keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So these two views, these two viewpoints, these two positions run right throughout Ecclesiastes. And it is so, we see, in Solomon's first sermon. Last time we said that there is a structure in Ecclesiastes. We have dealt by and large with the introduction that runs from verse 1 of this first chapter to verse 11. And now we commence in these four sermons, these four discourses that Solomon gives. And here then we come to the beginning of the first sermon that the preacher Solomon preaches which runs from verse 12 here in the first chapter right through to chapter 3 and verse 15. And in the first part then of this first sermon, Solomon in this message shows us how and in what he sought pleasure in this world apart from God. 
So you find then that he begins to deal with those avenues that he went down, those ways and means that he pursued the meaning of life. And this is echoed down through the generations with men and women up until this present time. And that is so in this first sermon until we see a change towards the end of this sermon in chapter 2 and verse 24, where we're brought again to God and viewing things from that perspective. It's interesting, up until then, the name of God appears only once, but now there is a cluster. So many times God is mentioned within a short compass from verse 24. And so for our message, friends, this evening, I want us to consider how Solomon then, first of all, sought the meaning of life in intellectual pursuit. And that will be our first point, in what he sought the happiness of life. And then the second point this evening, what did he find after pursuing fulfillment through intellectual activity. So first of all then, in what way did he first of all seek happiness? In what way did Solomon seek the meaning of life? Well, it is apparent from these words here in the first part of this sermon from verse 12 of chapter 1 that he sought it in knowledge. He sought it in the cultivation of his intellect. He saw that as, at one stage, the key to life. As perhaps he's at a crossroads in his life and he sees all these roads, and perhaps you've been in that position, out walking perhaps, probably, and you come to a place where there are several paths branching off and you wonder, which one should I take? So Solomon in his life came to this position and he thought to himself, how can I find the meaning of life? And he sees this path before him and he says this, that it is in the pursuit of wisdom. It is in the pursuit of knowledge. And not only for himself, but obviously as being king in Israel, he would have thought that then for his subjects. And his attitude would have been this at one stage. If we could just bring men and women up to a higher degree of knowledge, then it would be well. Society would be well. Men and women would be happy. And that then, of course, supposes that ignorance is the enemy. That ignorance is the problem. That it is ignorance and a lack of wisdom, it is a lack of knowledge that keeps people down, that makes them unhappy. What politician was it who said, education, education, education? And so countless numbers, of course, we're speaking about the modern era, have seen the panacea of all ills in raising the nation, in raising educational standards so that people get educated and that then will remove all the ills of society. This is how at one time Solomon viewed things. This is what Solomon sought after at one time. He thought to himself, did he not, this is the way to attain meaning, the meaning of life, Satisfaction lies in the pursuit of knowing things. And that is very clearly what we have in this opening part of this first sermon. He says in verse 13, I gave my heart, you see the words, to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. He sought it then as king in Israel as we have it there in verse 12, of course, and in the first verse. We are aware that God, as we've seen before, granted him 
an enlarged intellect and capability to receive wisdom. As God asked him what he would possess, what he would have, and you remember, of course, that he asked for wisdom. He looked out on his kingdom and he understood that he needed wisdom in order to rule, to know how to go out and come in before the people. It is of the essence of kingly rule to counsel. Of course, we have it ultimately in our Saviour, who is the wonderful counsellor. And we realise that Solomon was given beyond any man, save, and this could be an area of debate, Adam. Ability beyond himself, imparted by God. An increased ability to know, to receive, to study. And of course, we realize that being king over Israel in Jerusalem, he had the opportunity to increase in wisdom. He had the opportunity being in Jerusalem, the capital. And of course, under the blessing of God, it became a capital for other nations to confer with the intelligentsia of the known world. To learn from the greatest minds of that time. And to consider all the learning of the civilizations that had gone before. And the great intellectual minds of the East. As king, Solomon had access to every facility. We have computers now, but he had, if you like... The primitive equivalent of computers, he had access to various learning and the records of various libraries. His wisdom, because of the capacity that God gave him, was extensive. His mind had the capacity to take in truth and to retain truth. We drew attention to these words, didn't we, that deals with this whole area in 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse 29, in which we see the, the breadth of his learning. God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. You go down to the seashore, go to Rosili, go to Aberavon Beach and see how far you can see. And this is the extent, this is a way of putting the extent of the wisdom of Solomon. And his wisdom, we're told, excelled the wisdom of all the children of the East Country and all the wisdom of Egypt. And he was wiser than all men, we're told. And he spoke in verse 33 of that fourth chapter, trees and cedar and various plants and various animals. Every field of knowledge was open to him and pursued by him. Every field of biology, botany, plant life, zoology, animal life he would have had the greatest knowledge of these things in his day what a professor he would have been visiting if we were in university perhaps he had something of a photographic memory to retain the things that he studied the queen of sheba of course found it to be so till there was no more spirit in her. And his knowledge must have extended to all fields of science and the technological advances that there were then made at the time, and to geography and to history and the civilizations of the world, to politics. to philosophies and philosophers, 
held by men. To astronomy, to the looking upon the celestial bodies, the stars, the sun and the moon. We realize that those in the East were famed for that and probably the Magi, the wise men who came to Christ were those who were given to viewing the celestial bodies. And he reflects then, doesn't he, himself in his testimony here in verse 16 in this first chapter, I communed with my own heart saying, lo, I am come to great estate and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. Says one man here of the 16th verse, Solomon's search took him further than any of his predecessors, and he became the wisest man who ever lived. And verse 17, I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit. Says another, Solomon gave particular attention to the question as to what standard is to be used to decide whether something is wise or foolish. He sought the answer, the sunum bonum, the chief joy, happiness, contentment in wisdom, in knowledge. But the second point is this, and obviously you already know the answer to this, but we're going to demonstrate it. What did he find in this search? As he takes this pathway, the crossroads in his life, as at one stage he throws himself into a painstaking, diligent study to bring happiness to himself. Of course, the answer to that question is this. True happiness was not found there. It eluded Solomon. Education, knowledge proclaimed to Solomon, and he proclaims by his experience. Satisfaction, fulfillment is not found here. Of course, he's not saying to us that there is no profit in enhancing our understanding of the world. But there is every problem in seeing that knowledge will bring us the secret of true joy. And so what does Solomon find? Well, he finds that it was exhaustingly futile. He tells us here in the 13th verse, this sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. And further then at the end of verse 14, behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. And notice especially the futility of this search the search that gave no answers to the essential matters of life. For that which is crooked cannot be made straight. And that which is wanting cannot be numbered. And that's the verse that I would focus your attention upon at this point. For this is the conclusion that Solomon made in this pursuit of worldly wisdom. This is what he came to. And it's an interesting way of putting matters. For what is he saying there in the 15th verse? When he says the crooked cannot be made straight. And that which is wanting cannot be numbered. The Geneva notes. The notes that went with the Geneva version of the Bible comment in this way. It says that these words mean this, that man by knowledge is not able by all his diligence to cause things to go 
other than they do. Man by his knowledge and in that diligent search can't change things that are wanting. Cannot alter things that are crooked in order to make them straight. And cannot make up deficiencies. Indeed those deficiencies which cause us such dissatisfaction as we look out on the world and into our own hearts. They cannot, verse 15, even be numbered. The crooked cannot be made straight. Deficiencies cannot be numbered and certainly then cannot be made up. Knowledge, education, doesn't solve the major matters of life. Doesn't solve the evils that we see around us. And we can apply this then, the futility of seeking salvation in education, in wisdom alone, in two ways. To take up what we have in this verse with reference to the crooked not being made straight, and that which is wanting not being numbered. The futility of the search, the end of the search, doesn't bring us to true happiness. We can apply these things to two areas. First of all, we can apply these words in the futility of this search to what we term as providence. This morning we refer to providence. Providence is everything that happens in life. God is in control of the world in every event, whether it be large or small. Whether it be something that has to do with a, a national or, or major situation, or whether it has to do with a sparrow that falls from the sky. And it is in this way then that we look at chapter 7 and verse 13, because these words appear again, but it seems to be that evidently he's referring to providence. Consider the work of God, chapter 7, verse 13. For who can make that straight which hath made, he hath made crooked? And so there's an application then of this truth. Shows us the futility of finding salvation and wisdom to the whole realm of providence. And so what Solomon is saying is this, as he looks out on life, having pursued wisdom, knowledge, education, that there are things in the world that have happened, that do happen, that education cannot solve, that knowledge alone cannot remedy. And we can think of these things, can't we, as we look out on life and as we view the providence of God, that there are things that are crooked. And we can't fully understand them, but we know that God is sovereign in control of them. And so we could ask these questions tonight. Has education eradicated poverty? Has education removed conflict and wars? Has wisdom, has education amongst men taken away evil from society? Why well, think of the great civilizations themselves of the world past. Think of the great Egyptians and their abilities and yet they were idolaters. And they enslaved people. And they went to war. And they forced servants, didn't they? Maids and the like. Servants to go down to death with their deceased masters and mistresses in those great pyramids. Or you can take the Assyrians and their great wisdom. And yet they were a bloodthirsty race and perfected instruments of war and torture. And the same can be said for succeeding civilizations, the Babylonians and the Romans who had cast out infants to die. For all of the flowering of these worldly civilizations, these nations and kingdoms, they were of course at heart devoid 
of the true knowledge of God. And we can think, can't we, of the crooked injustices, if you like, in the world. The downtrodden, exploited poor. Ah, we can understand that the crooked is not made straight. Neither can the number of that which is wanting be reckoned up as we look at the world, as we look at history. For all of man's academic, intellectual pursuit, the world still is as it is. And we can look at our own country, can't we? And can't we say at the present time, never have we had such resources at hand and means of education. We referred earlier, of course, to the internet and to the computer. An abundance of academic riches. We can follow courses on the internet and the like. But for all of this, we ask this question, are we a happier people are men and women in our country fulfilled? If that is the case, why are there so many antidepressants being prescribed to people? Why is there so much depression and family breakdown and divorce? Why is there so much crime and dishonesty, embezzlement in high places? Our nation, because of its ungodliness, consists of a confused, depressed, unhappy people. And it is so, of course, in the realm of sexual ethics, where people believe that it's more knowledge that is required. But the knowledge has not brought about a moral renovation of the people. but has really led further to abortions on a higher scale. Ah, oh, we can understand this verse here in Solomon's quest that proved to be a dead end in terms of providence, in terms of looking out on the world, looking out on society. But we can also understand it in a second way. This Quest, this search through knowledge, through wisdom, doesn't bring about the solution. The crooked is still crooked and not made straight. That which is wanting, it cannot even be numbered for the deficiencies. And the second way that we can apply this, obviously, is to ourselves. We can apply this not merely to the society of men and women at large, but also to what man is in himself. And Solomon is saying here in these words that wisdom, knowledge, education, whatever it is, cannot, as Thomas Scott puts it, rectify the crookedness of men's dispositions and behavior. Take a criminal and educate him. And there might be perhaps some outer forms of gross conduct that he will not commit. And yet still at heart, the heart of the criminal is desperately evil. Education does not change anybody's nature. It can make an ungodly man more sophisticated in his sin. It is in this book, interestingly, that we have this text that I'm sure that we've come across before, we've read and we've wondered what it is, and perhaps we've consulted a commentary. In Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 29, as we cross-reference from the first part of Solomon's sermon, he says this, Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright that's how we were at the first in adam upright but they have sought out many inventions 
And many inventions, there's not these inventions that a professor in his shed comes up with, but inventions are evil devices. Man was upright at the first, endowed with righteousness, holiness, and knowledge, but he lost that, and he became crooked, and he became perverse. And through Adam's fall, his whole nature was darkened and his whole nature became twisted so that the things that he once loved, he, he now hates and the things that he ought to have hated, he now loves. There are so many windings in the human heart, such deceit, such darkness. The human heart is enmity against God. It is enmity against his law. And education cannot remedy this. The only thing that can remedy the ills, as God so in his sovereign grace applies, perhaps to a nation, to a community, to a church, to a family, is grace. And the only thing then, of course, that can remedy the crookedness, the perversity of the human heart is grace. You know, it reminds me of the demoniac. It's recorded in two places. In Mark's account, there's just one. And he's referred to as legion and you remember he dwelt amongst the tombs, crying out at night. And all that the community could seek to do for the demoniac was to chain him, to bind him, to contain the problem. But we know that he broke asunder his bands. He was stripped naked amongst the tombs. The ghastly shrieks in the night, warning the nearby inhabitants that he was there. All that the citizens could do was seek to contain the evil. And this is man's attempt to deal with the evil condition and state of man. It is to seek to contain the evil, but it's never the remedy. It's only grace that expels the evil. It is only grace that regenerates the soul. It is only grace that comes in conversion. It is only grace that can change a man or a woman. It is only God who can make straight that which is crooked. And I wonder, does it remind anyone this evening of the words of John the Baptist? You remember that John so came, preaching the word of God. He was that voice crying in the wilderness, speaking of the Messiah and that glorious work in him. Every valley shall be filled. Every mountain and hill shall be brought low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways shall be made smooth. Grace straightens sinners out. Grace makes men and women upright and righteous as to their standing and as to their condition. Education is important. But education does not bring salvation itself. Salvation is found in true education, in coming to Christ and learning of Christ with a Christ-like spirit and seeing that salvation, that salvation which is in him, our saviour. Our education itself can't save Pursuing various academic fields itself will not bring fulfillment to the heart. But it is in the pursuit of Christ and knowing Christ and possessing the pearl of 
great price, which is his.